here we are for session two. I'm Turley. I'm Laura. And we're hoping we're going to be able to give you some information about my career to entice you to go buy the book so you can read everything about it. But mainly I just want to share with you, you know, lifetime and all that kind of stuff. Just trying to become friends with you if we can. <laughs> so we're going to start. <laughs> you can Facebook us. <laughs> We're going to start back kind of at the beginning of the book and just kind of take you real briefly through some of the highlights. Oh, you're going to do the synopsis type thing? Yeah. Just so much. Yeah. yeah. Cool. I got my cheat sheets in front of me, which oh. I can't believe I even need since I've read this thing out loud now, um, probably six or seven times. If you haven't been before, <laughs> Turley is, a, is blind, so um, he was reading the book on a screen reader, which has a very robotic voice. Don't do it again. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I started reading it to him. I told her I was blind. <laughs> she bought it. Anyway. I'm not doing anything for you anymore. <laughs> not that I do that much to start out with. Yeah. Um, when the book starts out, you kind of go back to a memory that was, I believe, about 15 or 20 years ago, maybe, where you had undergone some hypnosis to try mm -hmm. to bring back what actually happened to you as a four-year-old child when that bow and arrow hit you. Uh, I have a, or I did have a great counselor I used for some other things, but he had hypnotized me one time for me to be able to do an MRI. For some reason, I was, uh, uh, what's that called? Um, claustrophobic. Yeah, claustrophobic. Yeah. And I, I'm a big guy. I'm 6'3 ish and 230 pounds, 40 pounds. And trying to get in that and having it right above my face kind of scared me. So he hypnotized me. So you decided to use them again. So I called him asking him if he could do it again. Now, this actually was in 1990, so I'm going to say 95, mm -hmm. 96. And so he did. He hypnotized me with the hopes that I was going to go back and see if I could find myself as, because that other one, I was back to a nine-year-old boy that found the problem. So the hoping we might be able to do the same thing again. So we um, we tried it, and, I mean, everything happened. I me saw me, the little boy, being shot with the air. And it was quite traumatic. It was very um, sad for me to do that as an adult now, to go back and remember that. And all the stuff that happened with mom and my aunt Flossie, my aunt Flossie, I love that, uh, which I'm not going to go into detail because of, I mean, want you to sit in the book. <laughs> but you had, you had a really uh, profound realization at the end of that. That caused you to do something that I would not want you to do if you were in my office. Um, but knowing knowing you, I I, know, I understand that that then had to let you go that day because what was it that you discovered? I had to go and talk see my mom immediately because my dad had blamed my mom all those years for the air accident you know, that happened. She should have been watching me and da da da. But she carried that all those years. I was, might as well say how many years? How about? <laughs> 46 to, to 85. Yeah. She carried on, you know, all those years she carried that, that it was her fault. And so I had to go back to her. And, you know, it was quite a, when I put my arms around her, told her I loved her and, and I forgave her, it was not her fault. I felt a thousand pounds come off her back and we both just stood there and cried. You know, it was kind of, a, it was a great feeling for her and, and made me feel good because I did something good for her. You always get real emotional when you talk about your mom, and I think that's because you have such a strong bond with her. Mm -hmm. And there's a real strong thread of of her message of perseverance and hope throughout your book. Um, tell me a little bit about where you grew up and what your family was like. Well, I grew up in South Charleston, West Virginia. Uh, it had West, South Charleston was kind of like a Mayberry, and I just it, the streets were really funny. They were one to eleven. And A to G. <laughs> That's small. And that was down on the, the, the flat. And then we go uh, over the tracks up the hill and we had the rest of South Charleston. Uh, I went to, didn't, I wasn't able to go to school until I was eight years old because of uh, these early surgeries after losing the eye with the bone arrow. And I uh, went to Central and then I went to Edison and then finally South Charleston Junior High. And that's where I started doing that. My music started coming out. And there's things in the book that tell you concerning a kazoo, how I started getting into music. Uh, but we got into, you know, the integration of the schools and mm -hmm. 
uh, four black kids and me formed a doo-wop group. We called ourselves the Five Pearls. Hmm. Probably should have called it Domino One because it was one white guy and four black guys. <laughs> if, <laughs> if we'd have been hipper, we'd have named it that. But we <laughs> You're and, a kid. And we did stuff like, Shudu, Shubidu, Shudu, Shubidu, all that kind of stuff. In the still. And that was a lot of fun. We sang around the, the town a little bit, you know, the different schools. And then I went on to, to bands. And then eventually my second band, which was, well, the first band was Is that called, before or after you got kicked out of the choir? <laughs> after. Yeah. Um, I got kicked out of the choir, of the chorus. It sounds like I got kicked out. I was asked to leave. Oh, that's a nicer way of putting and, it. And, <laughs> She said to me, and this is in the book. I might as well go ahead and say this. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, she came up and she said, "I'm going to have to ask you to to leave the choir." And I said, "What did I do wrong?" Of course, I usually did something wrong. <laughs> so I just automatically thought I was quite a, a restless child. That um, one eye didn't hold you back much, did no, it? No, it did not. You know, know. one eye blind, blind and one eye couldn't see all the other, but I still did everything, basketball and all that. But she said. I said, well, what did I do wrong? She said, well, honey, nothing wrong. She said, your problem is, you know, one minute you're singing bass, then you're singing baritone, then you're singing tenor, and then for God's sakes, you go up and sing alto, and then you jump up and do soprano. Well, being a vocal coach now for over 20 years, uh, the first thing I would have said, oh, my God, you got one hell of a range, but that never came out of her mouth, and she uh, left the... <laughs> I left the choir. Yeah. <laughs> and when I found signed my first big record deal in New York, I sent her a copy of the check. <laughs> but that was, your mom stepped in for you then also and took you to your one and only vocal lesson, right? Yes, yeah, she took me to Iris Bell, who's passed away. But Iris was a great jazz singer, and she was a vocal coach in Charleston. And she took me to her, and, and she let me sing. She had me hit notes and stuff like that, and got me to sing. And then she turned to my mom said, I can't do anything for him. said, he's got perfect fundamentals. His, his pitch is perfect. Uh, why did you bring him here? And mom said, well, he was kicked out of the choir because they said he, he – uh, mom didn't know how to say range. And when she told the story, that's when she said, Oh my God, that's an incredible ring. Hit this note, Charlie, or Richard. And I went, ah, I'm hit, hit this. Ah. You know, so what like, incredible insight from your mom also to know that that was what you needed in order to not quit. Yeah. Well, that's how she did in all my life. I mean, she always said, Richard, don't you ever let anybody. You have two minutes left. Yeah. <laughs> don't you ever let anybody tell you that you're handicapped. And that was one of the best things she taught me, you know. And so I, I tried everything I could, no matter what. And I usually did better than 80% of the sight of people, you know, in anything, especially anything athletics. We have an athletic family. But she said we got two minutes to go, basically. And what was her, to finish up that little discussion about your parents, your mom, mm -hmm. what was the one thing that she always said to you? Defeat is no option and that you never give up. Never, ever give up. And my whole life has been that. And when you read my book, you'll see what that means. Uh, no matter what came my way. And I don't think I did it like my mom told me I needed to be this way, and I, and I tackled something. I just did it. And, I mean, when I was told I was going to go blind, the first thing I did was go out and buy crayons so I could and put them on my wall so I could remember colors. So, you know, it's just something innately in me from my mom. And she was an angel, absolute angel, just like my new angel right here. <laughs> it's my new bride, and I'm, you know, I was her blind date. So, oh, God. <laughs> God, I'm sorry. All right. Tell All right. They can get the book before we go off the event. Uh, they get the book by going to www.turleyrichards.com. All kinds of information on there. My career, you know, who I did work with on stage and, and, and record labels. They have a choice of either having the hardback book, which comes with a six song CD, or the ebook, which still comes with the download with the six song. Just to qualify, it's not hardback, but it's paperback. Yeah. So, Physical they don't anyway. anyway, that's it. So, we'll see you. This is session two. We'll be back for session three later. Bye bye. <laughs>